welcome again to the bigger picture we're still on daniel 8 and this is part 5 and our focus text remains the same but before we start let us pray our heavenly father please teach please guide please sanctify we humbly ask in the name of jesus christ amen so our focus text daniel 8 verse 14 and he said unto me unto 2300 days then shall the sanctuary be cleansed now we had a question unanswered from the previous presentation which was why is the 2000 year prophecy so long well before we can properly answer that we have to first look at the parallel visions in daniel and that's daniel chapter 2 7 and 8 all three reveal the kingdoms that will rule the world and what are those kingdoms that's babylon Medo persia greece and rome and all of these kingdoms conquer by physical conquest what does god kingdom conquer in the same way with physical conquest it says in luke 17 verse 20 to 21 the kingdom of god cometh not with observation neither shall they say lo here or lo there for behold the kingdom of god is within you that means that the conquest isn't for a country or between races are defined by military might. It is fought within us and for our minds. It is a spiritual warfare. The only fighting then, according to the Bible, is the good fight of faith. So what we want to do is to look at chapter Daniel chapter 2, 7 and 8 and see how the kingdom of God is described. All right? So in Daniel 2 verses 34 to 35, so this is after the, the great image, after you see the gold, the silver, the bronze and the iron and the iron and clay. And then it says, thou sawest till that a stone was cut out without hands, which smote the image upon his feet that were of iron and clay and break them to pieces. Now the vision says that God's kingdom is represented by a stone that is cut out without hand. Well, what does without hand mean? It says in Mark 14, verse 58, We heard him say, I will destroy this temple that is made with hands, and within three days I will build another made without hands. Now this is a text that's in reference to the false accusers when they took Christ to trial. But to gain an understanding of what it really means when the Bible says without hand, we, we have to go to what Christ actually said, not what the accusers said, right? And what he said in John 2, verse 19, verse 20, 21, Verse 19 alone, it says, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. Christ spoke of his resurrection power. The same power available for each of us to be raised with the new life. And being born again means we have entered into God's kingdom according to John 3 verse 5. The stone then in Daniel 2 is a representation of the everlasting gospel of Jesus Christ. His life, death and resurrection. It says in Romans 1 16, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth. So the gospel of Christ, his life, death and resurrection, that is the power of God for us that will save us for any of us who will believe. I hope that is clear. The power that we need to be saved is in the life, death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. It is this power of God unto salvation that we hope in. Therefore, we are not ashamed because God has sworn by himself that he will accomplish it for us if we believe. So now that's Daniel chapter 2. Now when we go over to Daniel 7, this is how the kingdom of God is described after it goes through the lion, the bear, the leopard, and the indescribable beast. Then it says this in, in, verse, seven, in verse 9 and 10. I beheld till the thrones were cast down, and the ancients of days did sit, whose garment was white as snow, and the hair of his head like pure wool. His throne was like the fiery flame, and his wheels as burning fire. A fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. Thousands, thousands ministered unto him, and ten thousands times ten thousands stood before him. The judgment was set, and the books were opened. And then a little later down in verse 22, you see Daniel asking about the vision. So he's describing what he's describing the vision that he saw, asking what the interpretation is. And so this is what Daniel says when he's describing what he saw 
in verse 22. He says, until the ancient of days came and the judgment was given to the saints of the Most High and the time came that the saints possessed the kingdom. That's what Daniel says he saw. The ancient of days coming and the judgment given to the saints. And then a little later down in verse 26, the interpretation of that same part is given to Daniel. And this is what it says. But the judgment shall sit and they shall take away his dominion to consume and to destroy it unto the end. So that they, in verse 26, has to be the saints in verse 22 who are given the judgment. So somehow the judgment set is the judgment given to the saints and sitting, which will take away the little horn's dominion. So question, what does it mean that they are given judgment? What is that judgment and how do they receive it? And what is that judgment when it sits? Well, in John 5, verse 21 to 22, it says, For as the Father raiseth up the dead and quickeneth them, even so the Son quickeneth whom he will. For the Father judgeth no man, but hath committed all judgment unto the Son. Now, there's a word that connects judgment and the power of the new life through Christ's resurrection. And that word that connects those two things is justification now we know that there are two ways that you can be um, in judgment right you can either receive a guilty verdict which means you're condemned or you will receive the verdict of innocence which means you are justified right it says in John 3 verse 17 to 18 for God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world but that through the but that the world through him might be saved he that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Christ has been committed all judgment, but it is not to condemn. And if it is not to condemn, then what's the other judgment? It is to justify. His judgment is to give salvation through justification. But here's the problem. We, who he wants to justify, are guilty. So that means, that means that Christ's judgment of justification has to be based on the penalty of our guilt being served and paid for, for the soul that sinneth must die. But not just that. It also means that God has to be justified that those who receive unmerited favor will not be found guilty again. If they are, the grace received by the wrongdoer will be ultimately be in vain because it never produced a change in them and ultimately they will die in the end. So we are given grace, that's unmerited favor, and we are guilty but we receive grace through Jesus Christ. But then if we carry on sinning, we basically make that grace of, of um, non-effect because we will sin again and the penalty for our sins in death and so ultimately we will still die this is where the power of Christ's resurrection comes in for when we are crucified with him we die yet we live but not us but Christ lives in us and it is his life in us that is the life of righteousness in Romans 6 verse 5 to 6 and 14 it says for if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death we shall also we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection knowing this that our old man is crucified with him that the body of sin might be destroyed that henceforth we should not serve sin for sin shall not have dominion over you for ye are not under the law but under grace According to Romans 5 verse 18, the entire world is condemned to death through Adam, so all have sinned. The only judgment left then is to be justified on the merit of Christ's righteous life, death, and resurrection. The only reason we are condemned and not justified, according to John 3 18, is if we don't believe. In Job 9 verse 20, it says, if I justify myself, Mine own mouth shall condemn me. Condemnation comes where there is no faith. Therefore, justification without faith is an effort to justify ourselves. 
This is self-righteousness or righteousness by works. And this is our filthy rags. That is why the Bible makes it clear that the just shall live by faith or the justified one shall live by faith. That is chapter 7 of Daniel concerning God's kingdom. Now we will go to Daniel 8 to see how God's kingdom is described. So just like Daniel 2 and Daniel 7, you have the delineation of the worldly kingdoms and then you have God's kingdom and in Daniel 8 is the same thing. It doesn't start at Babylon, but it starts at Medo-Persia with the ram, then Greece with the he-goat and then the little horn and then in verse 13 and 14, we then have the text. Then I heard one saint speaking and another saint said unto the certain saint which spake, how long shall be the vision concerning the daily sacrifice and the transgression of desolation to give both the sanctuary and the host to be trodden on the foot? Verse 14, our focus text. And he said unto me, unto 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. That means then that the establishing of God's everlasting kingdom is irrefutably connected to the cleansing of the sanctuary. Now, what is the chief cornerstone or central pillar of the seventh, seventh day Adventist beliefs? It is the sanctuary message. The question How is the sanctuary and its cleansing connected to everything we've already learned from the depiction of God's kingdom in Daniel chapter 2 and 7? Well, it is this in Jeremiah 33, verse 16. It says, In those days shall Judah be saved. And Jerusalem shall dwell safely. And this is the name wherewith she shall be called. The Lord, our righteousness. In 1 John 1 verse 9 it says, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So think about it. If we are cleansed of all unrighteousness then Christ's righteousness will then prevail in us Christ's righteousness is imputed to us and imputing deals with rendering it to our account we're being credited with serving the death sentence because of our sins when it was Christ who became us and paid it that's how we credited um, credited the justification because Christ became us and died the penalty of our sins and so his victory in paying that penalty is awarded to us right but that credited account not only has validity but power god's creative power that means god's creative power means that christ's righteousness that is credited to us also has power to transform us this is the impartation imparting means communicating information or proclaiming something so just as god's word was community communicated and created the world in the beginning so he said let there be light and there was light he proclaimed what should be and it was this is the process of sanctification in our lives and christ's righteousness is imparted is declared in our lives in the same way that it is imputed it is by faith so the big question then is what is the connection between the kingdom of god and why the 2300 year prophecy is so long there is an overarching principle that god's kingdom is built on if you uh, if you would have understood everything we've gone through so far the kingdoms of this world guided by satan opposes this principle and remember the warfare is spiritual so where is the war between the principle of god and the principle of satan it's in our minds right justification by faith and right and the righteousness of jesus christ is the greatest theme against satan because it is the power that defeats him once we have that power of the gospel of jesus christ that is unto salvation in us then where is the room for Satan? It is nowhere at all. He is defeated. So his aim then, Satan's aim then, is to always keep us in unbelief concerning that power. 
The cleansing of the sanctuary is the re-establishment of this glorious gospel. So when the Bible talks about cleansing the sanctuary and rebuilding the sanctuary in type, we should always think about it in the anti-type and it is spiritual. So that means it's a re-establishment of that everlasting gospel that just the just shall live by faith and that we are righteous, not of ourselves, but it is Christ, the Lord, our righteousness. But the Bible also take, says that it takes 2,300 years for the true gospel to be rebuilt. In the previous presentation, we realized that the 2,300 years prophecy started on the same date that Jerusalem was rebuilt. And there were some specifications in identifying that date. It said in Daniel 9 verse 25 that the wall had to be built before Jerusalem could be considered rebuilt. Now, a brief study of the Bible would tell us that cities are only called cities during Bible times if they are walled. The wall was considered what the wall was the protection from invading enemies. Right. And in Isaiah 60, verse 18, it says, violence shall no more be heard in thy land, wasting nor destruction within thy borders. But thou shalt call thy walls salvation and thy gates praise. So no groups of people dwelling together could be called a city until they had a wall. And question, what happens when a wall is removed? It tells you in Isaiah 5 verse 4 to 5, it says, What could have been done more to my vineyard that I have not done in it? This is God talking. Wherefore, when I looked that it should bring forth grapes, brought it forth wild grapes. Verse 5. And now go to, I will tell you what I will do to my vineyard. I will take away the hedge thereof, and it shall be eaten up. I will break down the wall thereof, and it shall be trodden down. That statement should sound very familiar to you if you've been going with us in Daniel 8. The sanctuary and host are given into his hand, that's the little little horn hand, to be trodden down because the wall of salvation was removed. And in Daniel chapter 7, it tells you how long it is given into, into the little horn's hand in anti-type. It says in Daniel 7 verse 25, And he shall speak great words against the Most High, and shall wear out the saints of the Most High, and think to change time and laws. And they shall be given into his hand until a time, times, and dividing of time. So from 538 AD, for 1260 years, the little horn in the anti-type tramples underfoot the Santrian host during what the history books call the Dark Ages. Question, why is it allowed to do that? Remember what the walls mean? Salvation. And God says in Isaiah 5 verse 4 and 5 that he will remove the walls of salvation when the fruit he should have gotten is instead wild. The walls are removed because the right fruit was lacking. How does removing the walls because of the fruit connect to the little horn, you may ask? Well, let's turn to 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 3. It says, let no man deceive you by any means. For that day shall not come except there come a falling away first what happens first a falling away then that man of sin be revealed the son of perdition so what is that falling away so that little horn power will stand up and then everybody be given into his hand it says in galatians 5 verse 4 christ is become of no effect unto you christ the gospel of jesus christ has become no effect unto us Whosoever of you are justified by the law, ye are fallen from grace. So the reason why the man of sin was revealed, the son of perdition, is because that falling away that happened first was a falling away from grace. So, so that wild fruit is connected with those who are trying to be justified by the law. Because if you are not under grace, you cannot bear the fruit of the spirit of grace. Is there any more evidence? Do we have any more evidence linking this fall from grace to the little horn? Yes. When we turn to Revelation, when it talks about the first church out of the seven churches, 
it says in Revelation 2 verse 5, speaking of Ephesus, it says, Remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen and repent and do the first works, or else I will come unto thee quickly and will remove thy candlestick out of its place, except thou repent. So as the Christian church is being established by the disciples after Christ returned to his father in heaven, a different so-called gospel is already being introduced, which is without the power of God unto salvation. This text asks us to remember grace because it is from that we have fallen, for we are saved by grace through faith. We are made righteous by faith and from the rebuilding of the kingdom of Jerusalem in type, it takes 2,300 years for God to have a body, to have a body of people who will reclaim and spiritually reconstruct the everlasting gospel of Jesus Christ, that the just shall live by faith. You see, the work started with the early Protestant movements like Martin Luther, and this ultimately led to the wounding of the Little Horn Papal Power in 1798. But it's from 1844 that the path of the righteous shone brighter regarding the knowledge of justification by faith in Christ's righteousness. That means then that the cleansing of the sanctuary involves a message that we dearly, dearly need to understand that it may sanctify us. Because it is truth and God's word that sanctifies us. So if there's a part of it we truly don't understand, it is unable to sanctify us. And therefore, that is what God is trying to get us to a place where we'll truly understand the everlasting gospel of Jesus Christ. For therein is the power of God to save us. It says in Job 29 verse 14, I put on righteousness and it clothed me. My judgment, my judgment, our judgment was as a robe and a diadem. By faith, we are to stand before the judgment seat of Christ, like Joshua the high priest. Question, did God, did Christ condemn Joshua? No, but Joshua and Christ were not alone. Satan was also there accusing. He's the one condemning. And what was the answer to Satan's accusation? Christ rebuked him. Then Christ asked for the filthy garments to be removed. That's the cleansing of all of our righteousness. And then he placed his righteousness on Joshua. That means that the judgment is set and it is in our favor. It is good news. It is an everlasting gospel. So we don't so we so we don't need to fear or to, to, to be in, in dread over the judgment of God. For he has not come to condemn but to justify. And he justifies with his righteousness. There is divine power available to have full victory over every sin that so easily besets us but the question is do we believe it because it's been nearly 200 years since the 2300 years ended that means that it is time for the stone to strike what picture do you see forming from daniel 8 verse 14 blessings